but yeah, I mean, this week, uh, you know, there's there's an increasing push to you know have the patriotic education in Hong Kong schools. And what better time than Chinese China's National Day when the CCP took over China? That's right. Yeah, it's interesting. The Washington Post came out with this article about how. The way that they're trying to do patriotic education in Hong Kong is different than the way they did it in China after the Tiananmen Square massacre. Mm -hmm. Mostly in the sense that they're not trying to like outright push Marxism because they understand that that wouldn't be too popular in the international business uh, mecca of Hong Kong. Yeah, but also that it wouldn't be really almost understandable to people in a certain sense. Like people in China have to take these Marxist-Leninism classes from the time that they're you know, in preschool almost. Mm. Like they're... Right, but also the, the kids in school in mainland China now are like third or fourth generation communists. Like their parents, their grandparents, even great-grandparents grew up under that Marxist-Leninist system. Whereas people in Hong Kong, it's like a kid goes to school and they come home and their parents have lived free for a long time. And so there, like, there's going to be scrutiny. There's going to be like... You know, parents trying to be like trying to undo it. So it, it's got to be way more subtle. Yeah. Uh, and it's got to be also, yeah, understandable. Like you got to introduce Marxism kind of slowly. So the patriotic education in Hong Kong right now, and that was also part of the article where people were like, uh, some of the people in charge of the education bureau were like, oh, hey, we don't, we have, pay, we have time. You know, that story about uh, that th saying about how it takes 10 years to grow a tree, but 100 years to grow a man or something like that. So they're no. like, oh, we have time to slowly you know, get the, the Hong Kong people on our side. So it's n not so much about the political system as it is about how Hong Kong is part of China, you know, trying to erase the idea that Hong Kong, being a Hong Konger is an identity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you're Chinese, you're not a Hong Konger. Um, you know, how great the national security law is. A lot of, uh, you know, school trips about how the national security law keeps everybody safe, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, taking that slow approach through the, you know, the long march through the institutions, uh, it, it, it can be very, it is very effective in the long term. Well, and the, it's a little different for the CCP because they also have uh, the mechanism of the state behind them. Like, mm -hmm. Matt, you mentioned that people in Hong Kong would push back, the parents would push back. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what that's what started the protests in 2014 was a, few, a couple of years before that there were, I mean, it's not what started the protests in 2014, but a lot of those younger activists like Joshua Wong, they started because they were protesting uh, the... Uh, patriotic education campaign that they wanted to put into effect around like 2012 or 2013, something like that. Mm -hmm. And there was like a lot of pushback. And because the CCP didn't have the national security law uh, in Hong Kong at the time, they didn't have the um, enforcement mechanisms to make it happen. But now they do. Yeah. I mean, it's like you go back to 2003 and you know, them trying to get Article 23 passed in Hong Kong. It didn't succeed then. But, you know, if you look at the past 20 years of Hong Kong, they've been slow and steady and they have pushed very, very far. Mm -hmm. And we'll see Article 23, the anti-subversion law kind of thing, uh, being passed pretty soon in Hong Kong. They've, you know, they've already taken over the legislature. All of the Democrats ha are pretty much in prison mm -hmm. or exile. And so they're not going to have any opposition to passing that law now. Um, Matt, maybe we won't be taking you to Lantau Island. Have I really depressed you? <laughs> uh, we haven't even talked about how they're probably bugging all the foreign missions in China. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, Hong that's, Kong. That's, that was a crazy development that they're at. They're demanding that they give like floor plans and even like was it the phone numbers of the official of the diplomats like homes or was it like the floor plans for their homes as well? I forget what that was. Don't remember if it was floor plans for their homes, but it was definitely like rental and leasing agreements, which will also give you addresses. That's that's right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's a scary thing if you're because if you have a diplomatic mission and in, in uh, Hong Kong's case, I believe they're their consulates or consul generals 
Uh, and those are supposed to be, I know technically it's not foreign soil, but in effect, it should be treated like it is, foreign soil. It is treated. A consulate or an embassy is treated like foreign soil. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I meant I didn't want to get into like a technical debate ah. about, about how that works. But like the point is that that a country's diplomatic mission is supposed to have uh, privacy and protection within their walls from other from the host country's laws, right? Like that's how, like we allow the Chinese consulates here in the U.S. to operate how they want within within those walls, right? Well, which is why some got shut down. But uh, yeah, so it's a scary idea that the Chinese right. well, no, they, they, they got sh they got shut bug. down. The one in Houston got yeah. shut down, not because of what was happening inside the consulate, but because of what they were doing. Uh, to like outs like the 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 infiltration they were doing externally. So they basically the, people, the Trump administration accused it of being a spying hub, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Also, there was some drug trafficking, I believe. I don't remember that. I, I swear I, I heard something. Well, anyways, I'll, I'll go back and look at that. But anyway, so Hong Kong, uh, yeah, like being bugged by. I mean, China built the African Union building and bugged that up and down. Um, the the other, you know. This is a little more out there, but there, you know, in the U.S. consulates in China, there's been talk of, you know, maybe sonic weapons have been used against diplomats. I don't know about that because that's very... It's it's, it's kind of out there, but, you know, who I mean, knows what... If the Communist Party has access to the floor plans and all of this, like, who knows what they will use that I, for? I, I mean, they and would I, definitely I do use believe it for they, they have the guile to do that kind of sonic boom. They just have to do it like this. Uh, you know, that was a hat on a hat. I was gonna give you credit like that. I like that guy. You get, do you get it, Shelley? No. Uh, is this a Sonic the Hedgehog reference? Oh, oh Shelley. No, I don't know. Is this like a Street Fighter? Yes. Movie? Okay. Thank you. Yes. There's a character named Guile. He's the American, and he has an attack called Sonic Boom. Okay. I mean. I'm not sure why you guys are so disappointed in me. Does it seem like I had Street Fighter as a kid? Yes. <laughs> I thought this was maybe one of your th the things where like your dad bought Street Fighter, you know, for the kids. Yeah, I don't think my mom would have let him get away with that. <laughs> but he had Leisure Suit Larry. Oh, that was that was on the computers at the physics lab. Oh, it wasn't what? at a which, person, which makes it weirder somehow. But okay. Uh, it yeah. I mean, there were a lot of games on those computers. Not, uh, yeah, like Digger and Frogger and other. And Leisure Suit Larry, you know, like Leisure those Suit children's Larry. games. I guess we could stream Leisure Suit Larry. That'll bring back some. But only memory. like the 1980s pixelated version. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway. Uh, so. I mean,. It, foreign missions in China all expect to be bugged in some way, I think. I don't know about mm -hmm. like specifically the embassy buildings inside the embassy buildings, mm -hmm. but um, I remember uh, there was a journalist, Louisa Lim, who was living in China in an apartment that was somehow um, connected to, like, I forget what the situation was, but essentially like, everybody living there knew that it was bugged pretty mm -hmm. much. So she was writing a book about Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. So she solved this problem by never speaking out loud about the book that she was writing and only working on it on a laptop that she never connected to the internet. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And this was, you know, almost a decade ago. So I wonder if even that like you would have to take even more precautions now. Yeah, I mean, who knows what they are able to do with like cell phones now, um, especially if you have ever installed like a WeChat or TikTok Douyin. It is very hard to live in China without having WeChat. Yeah, so yeah, it's carrying around spy devices in our pockets, especially if you're in China or Hong Kong now. Mm -hmm.